So, good morning, everyone. I welcome you to our last lecture of the course Collective Dynamics of Firms. As you have uh, been informed by my email last night, so we have a special program today. I apologize for not presenting you more new material, but uh, I think if I look back on the whole course, you already learned a lot, so maybe you we should spend the time discussing the outline of the course today, answering your questions and comments that you may have. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to start with the um, with the uh, evaluation. Which one is this one? Okay. Yes. Okay. So you probably recall that everyone was kind enough to fill in this evaluation sheet, and this is what we get back here. Yeah. And I would like to discuss this with you. First, to give you some feedback, but secondly, because it's also required by the rectorate, right? So, I mean, I have to do it. Um, so the evaluation is anonymous, first of all. So secondly, the evaluation has a number of uh, flaws or uh, drawbacks, which will uh, lead to a complete new layout of this evaluation in the coming years. So this is the last time where we did this with the punch-stamped uh, sheets and so on. All right, so there were six people of this course who uh, returned their evaluation sheets. That's very nice, but you can already guess that there is a yeah, bad statistics on this. Yeah, that's the first thing. The second thing is every elective course is evaluated better than a core course, right? Why is this? because you have decided yourself to participate in this course, right? That's the difference to the core course, at least for the, uh, for the MTEC students. So they have to participate in this core course, whereas in the elective course, that was your free decision. Consequently, and that's a psychological issue, yeah, you usually rate a course that you have chosen yourself better this is not to question your own decision. Right? So that's a psychological issue. We know this from any other survey or um, voluntarily work and so on, that people give a better judgment about things if they voluntarily decide to do this uh, as compared to they are paid for something. Right? So, okay, let us go through this. So this is... So the number of MTech students, four, the number of physics students, three, I think, oh, except of, from, of Wahan, there's no other physics student, right? Wha what are you, what department are you in? MTech, okay, no, there are Alexander Gott. Okay, so uh, I'm one person from Mars, and then you see here uh, most of them were uh, master students. So I scroll through this, so there is the first block, one, two, three are the rector's question, and this is all, yeah? Uh, I have a question, is it difficult because it has six people on a page, uh, yeah. and the number of colors is eight? Uh, <laughs> yes, you are... Is two and all things are under bachelor or master's uh, uh, Oh, that's interesting, yes. Uh, I would assume it's eight, yes, yeah, it's eight. I don't know, maybe <laughs> I was misled by this, but maybe not everyone has crossed uh, his or her gender, right? So, okay, you are right, thanks a lot, yeah. There are eight people. Okay, this is how it looks like. You see, the first three questions, uh, the answers are returned to the rector. Yeah? And if there are problems, 
with the course, and of course this will be discussed uh, with the study delegate and the professor, and in yeah, urgent case also with the rector and the professor. So <coughs> this was all very positive. This is about the language, this is about the course material, and this is about uh, commitment to good teaching. If you have comments or questions, then we can discuss this. So then we come to the second part, uh, the blue one, which is asked by MTEC. So, well structured. So, people are not that optimistic about this. I come to uh, this in a moment when we look into uh, the personal comments. That's on another sheet, right? You could also write something. Learning objectives, so this is also something which I would like to discuss afterwards. Yeah, what were the learning objectives of this course? Because it seems to be not so very clear. Oh, but maybe I should do it right now. Oh, let's go through this first. So, so sufficient scientific details, also positive, real current issues. That's positive. Course material helped me to follow the lectures. So there, of course, I mean, this means one person, right? So, uh, but here I would certainly like to know what this person may expect you. Maybe um, a script or something like this, right? So I don't know exactly, but that would be of interest to us, right? So, uh, encourage active participation, that's also like in the normal range, motivated, think independently, instructor deployed, media, bam, 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 fine. Enthusiasm, so here you see maybe a bimodal distribution, huh? there is a peak uh, of this. Why is there a lack of enthusiasm on your side? So that could be another Question number three, right? So, and then let me go to the last slide here. Okay. No. Not this. Okay, here. Practical work, 50 50. I think you usually appreciate it. So, this refers to Pavlin, all the positive. And most of you recommended the course, so that's fine. I show you the second sheet first. So, this is there were there's place for comments, right? Someone, uh, two people in your particular case wrote something here, and we read this first, and then we discuss it. Uh, the course is very interesting. Possible improvement would be to make the learning objective more clear. This also refers to one of the questions here. For example, being more explicit about what we must focus on, what is not important, okay. All of the material is interesting, but it's not possible to understand and remember everything at all the levels. That's Certainly true. So this was the second comment. Excellent slides, well structured, outlook further material, very helpful. Okay, very good. So let me go to this question about the learning objective. I switch to this other one, or do you need to read this again? No, certainly not. But this is how we get it, yeah, in these PDF files. So let me go to this. So Um, the learning objectives. So, what would what should you learn in this course? According to my understanding, the most important thing is to get a quantitative approach towards dynamics of firms. So we have courses in the department, and the MTEC students know this uh, quite well where the focus is on strategies of individual firms, on how you position yourself in the market, and all these uh, important issues. But these courses lack the big picture, the overall picture, right? What do we see in terms of 
regular patterns if we look into a whole economy. And that was the focus of this course. So the first learning objective was to get this picture, to understand that on the macroscopic level, which is the systemic level, we see patterns emerging that you would not guess from looking into case studies, right? So there are regularities in the development of films, right? That's something extremely interesting. So that's the first learning objective. The second learning objective was how to quantify this. And we did this in two different cuts. So the first one looking into data, and the second one looking into models. And in the ideal case, we were also able to um, recover some of the stylized facts from um, uh, the data analysis with the models. So that means at the end, you should have gotten skills, both on the practical side, in particular, if you are confronted with data sets, you know how to handle this, you know what our studio is, you have no uh, fear to, to use these things. I mean, of course, you need to educate yourself. There is no question about this, but so this entry barrier, yeah, that's hopefully gone. So. And the second thing is you learn how to model these kind of things. So. The models, if you are a bit more uh, general, the models can be applied in various areas. But the basic understanding of how to pose an agent-based model, how to uh, extend agent-based models, that was taken in this course here. So that's the learning objective from my side. So basically, it refers to basic science, data analysis, and modeling, with an emphasis on a pattern that you would not see and not know about if you would not have taken this course. So that's my comment. Maybe you want to comment on this learning objectives and what was clear and what was not clear. Any question about this? Is this a clear learning objective or not? I don't know. I think if I'm correct in the first lecture, I was also mentioning some of these things. No? What this course is about and what this course is not about. I remember that I have taken some of this. Does this answer your question about the learning objective? If not, then it's a perfect time to now tell your own opinion about this. Hmm? No, no. Okay, so then the second issue. Uh, so yeah, here, uh, as I said, okay, I would like to know from this person what is the expectation, actually. Because we did a lot of work to, first of all, revise the slide, secondly, provide additional hints in the notes, uh, then provide you with additional material and so on. So there was, where was this other? Th Here. So the instructor aroused my enthusiasm for the subject and motivated me. Okay. So you took the course, but you were not really enthusiastic about it. That's the message, basically. So this, first of all, relates to expectations. No. Usually students have expectations when they attend the course, and these expectations are not met, so why should they be enthusiastic about it, right? So. <laughs> yes, of course, but this is, I mean, if you compare the distribution, then you see, okay, this, this one is different. So therefore, um, okay, I would like to yeah, maybe learn a bit more about this. Someone who wants to comment on this? What, what I thought, okay, let's assume at some point in time you find out 
that the content is of no interest to you. Yeah, you are the physicist, and then you probably are not interested in, in firms per se. And it took you like six to eight weeks to get to this point. Well, what you can still learn is how to analyze this data, how to build an agent-based model, where to put in economic assumptions as compared to basic dynamics assumptions um, about stochasticity and these kind of things. So my enthusiasm at some point would then come from the fact that I learned a lot here, right? So different things. And please also recall that there are uh, the self-study tasks, which are partly, yeah, I would say, yeah, they're not demanding, but they require your time and effort to spend. That's not something you can do in like five minutes or so, right? And this is not about reading something as in other courses or discussing with your neighbor about something. This is about practical skills. So my personal hope is that everyone here, independent of the subject and the enthusiasm about the subject, got a solid feeling about stochastic processes, what's their role in certain agent-based models, and so on. That's the idea of this. Yeah? So. Yes, please. Um, okay, I'm <laughs> no one will be blamed for this. I mean, we need to understand it, right? So. Yeah. This is very bold, bold that in the exercises, in yeah. the kind of project that we should apply the concept and um, co-engage it with yeah. the objectives. Yes. In this way, everybody is going to get more enthusiastic. Uh, that's, uh, okay, can, can you take a note? Yeah, sure. um, that's a good idea. Why didn't I follow this suggestion earlier? First thing, in every single course in MTech, you have a project, right? So that's a problem. So I did not, on purpose, wanted to create the same situation for you as a student, again, as in whatever supply chain management and all these kinds of things. So and even Professor Sonnet told me the other day that he has switched to projects now, yeah, which had to do with the exam and the grading and these kind of things. Right? So I would wanted to avoid this situation. I did not want to be the whatever 31st course uh, where you also have to do a project. So, and for me, it was important that, for example, if, if, you're, if you're from different departments, as this is the case here, that you could follow the course independently. I mean, I'm not sure how it was this year, but last year there were, I think, two or so students who were abroad. And they took still the course, so they followed these video lectures, they did the exercise, and then they showed up in the summer for the exam. Okay, that's also possible. Therefore, I thought, okay, something that educates you on a solitary basis and not in a, in a teamwork, that would be appropriate. I'm also a bit skeptical about projects. And when we started with this course, we had projects, and three times a semester you had to submit this project and you did it in a group work. So, okay. It was never clear to me who did what. Right? So my assumption was that at the end the only one person who was able to treat some data did it and all the others uh, just signed in yeah, and that was it. I wanted to avoid the situation. Yeah? If you want to see some like practical applications of this, then of course the chair has ample tasks to offer where you han handle real data and apply this to real questions. Then you do a semester work, like what Mahan is doing or what uh, Alex did before. That's possible, right? But I didn't want to make this the outline of the course. That's my personal opinion, right? And by the way, I think that with, with these weekly uh, exercises and with the self-study talks, at the end, personally, you do a lot more, right? So it's just my personal impression than with a project that you have to hand in at the end. Are there other comments? Yeah.
It's not really enthusiastic. Yeah. No, no, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Okay. Further comments or questions? Okay. So these were, I think, the two points. So then, was there anything else? No. Okay. So then. Let me come to this last question. What should I uh, learn for the exam and what is not really necessary? Right? So this was one of the comments. So regarding the exam, what we certainly will not do is to ask you for specific details of uh, deriving solutions of equations or something like this. Here I really make a difference between the physics department and the MTech department. This course is on offered in the MTech department, so that means for me it's very important that you understand the concept behind this. So that's the first thing, that you are also able to argue about this. Let's take the uh, model of Simon and Idiri or something like this. So what did they change compared to Debra? Right? So that's something you should really understand. Why did they do it? Second question. Third question is, what changed in the outcome? So these are the kind of things that you have to argue. Yeah? Of course, I would expect that you write down a dual Simon distribution as an equation. That's not a big deal from my perspective. Yeah? But the, uh, but if you if did some one of you ever looked into this paper by Simon where he derived it? Someone do it? So that's a very mathematical paper, right? So once you touch it, then you see, okay, that's very heavy stuff. This is not requested. You should understand what has changed and what is the outcome, the result, in terms of the distribution. And then, of course, you should argue of whether this is a better uh, Results and the previous one compared to what? Yeah, so that's then more about the argumentation. Of course, I mean we agree that entry dynamics is very important. Yeah? But are we at the end when we look into this skewed distribution? Are we able to really distinguish the Yule Simon distribution from a tail and a power law, or some? part of the log normal distribution, yeah, stretched part, or is, is it really possible, right? So these are questions where you should think about. Right? That's the kind of uh, what you should know and what you should not know, right? So it is also appropriate that, that you recall some of the basic R commands in order to uh, tell what you have learned. Remember that for the uh, exam, there are three different ingredients. Ingredient one is you had to pass the three online tests. Third one is yet to come. The second thing is you had to participate in these self-study talks, which you did, I assume. And then, of course, you had to uh, follow this lecture, right? That means we will certainly ask questions that are related to the self-study talks. And this means that you should recall a bit of the practical things that you did, right? So what's the command for the kolmogorov smirnov test, right? For the one-sided versus the two-sided. What's the difference between these two, right? So if you get an output like pum, 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 for D, yeah, some number, so is it now a confirmation of the null hypothesis or a rejection of the null hypothesis? You mu should be able to understand some sort of code and to interpret this. So these are le uh, skills that you should have and w that we certainly refer to in the e exam. So then, I mean, we can certainly discuss more about what, what should we know for the, for the uh, exam and what is 
interesting but not really needed. It's a bit difficult for me to, to give this in an abstract word. So, of course, the professor is always convinced that everything is important. Right? Otherwise, why should I spend my time on this? But that's certainly not the case. Right? So, I mean, what is important and what not? Uh, there we had these questions at the end of each lecture, which should guide you somehow to the important point. If you want to find out what's important, then I would start with these questions and would double check, am I able to answer these questions? Right? Um, as I said, I would also go and look into all the self-study talks and would understand, okay, what, what do, did I learn from this? Yeah. So there are a few boxes, yeah, uh, like learning talks and questions and uh, these boxes you should basically check yeah, with your own skills. Okay, I think we should not follow further discussion on this general level. It might be more appropriate if you ask your questions and then, if needed, I have all these slides here on the computer, then we can put it up and can discuss it together. Yeah, is it in, yeah? Or do you have further general comments on the course? I maybe I, I finish with a general comment. If you want to do your master's thesis with us, then you have to take the three courses that we offer, and the third course is uh, economic networks, right? So systems dynamics, which is a core course, collective dynamics of first, and economic networks. That's maybe an important uh, hint for you as well. Right? And I also explained, I think, some time before that we see this as these courses as uh, different levels of formalization and abstract thinking, and economic network certainly is the, well, the most abstract and demanding one, right? So, but it's also the one that is very close to research. So this is a bit more to basic knowledge and to skills. And systems dynamics and complexity is about dynamic thinking in general. Okay, so then with this we start with specific questions. Yeah, this is fine? Yeah, so Alex, you want to start? Uh, yeah, one question concerning lecture 10. Mm -hmm. the Shall I do it like this? I open it and then. Yeah, let's see. So, 10, yeah? Yeah, lecture 10. Um, so, lecture which slide? The most appropriate slide would be 11. 11. This one. one. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, well, what do we see on this graph? We see um, that after the emergence of the, of the core, mm -hmm. um, there are a certain, a certain time that crashes. And we yes. Is selected and then the core breaks down. But Correct. On the n on the x axis first is a time okay. right. So mm -hmm. that's a good question. We have two different times here in this model. Yeah, maybe I should recall this. There's a dynamics on two time scales. So on one time scale, which was plotted here, that's related to the n you modify the network. And on the other time scale, you let the nodes relax, right? Remember, for every node, there is a dynamic, x i dot equals something, right? So, and you first let the nodes relax to their equilibrium state, which is on a short time scale, and then on a larger time scale, you modify the network after the node have relaxed. Then you modify the network, the node relax again, you modify the network, the node relax again. So there are two time scales involved. Yeah? One at which uh, the nodes reach an equilibrium state, and the other one at which I uh, modify the network. So what's plotted here, so first of all, this is uh, the, the number of modifications of the network, if you want so, and this is the average uh, density of the link. Exactly. Yeah. The Mm -hmm, that's correct. So, but um, this fraction, in this fraction, the denominator and the numerator, they both scale with n. So, um, um, why, why is there a difference 
in, in amplitude of expression. So the M is related to the, that's all, the M is related to the um, probability to assign a link randomly, right? I think this was on the previous slide or somewhere. No, these are the pictures. Where do you see this? Yes, exactly, exactly. So, okay. And this constant and the p basically, uh, the p basically uh, varies. So, and this is, of course, the, what you see here is the average density L of the links is, of course, related to the M. If you choose a low p, then the network is quite sparse and you have a low density here. So, if you choose a higher, P, then the network gets quite dense, right? So that's a, so. Now the question is, why are these crashes and recoveries more visible if you have a uh, smaller M? That's a question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But this is this is. This is really the average num uh, links. No, that's the average number of links per node. Yeah. No? So, okay. And uh, if I have a larger p, then of course I have a denser network, mm -hmm. right? So therefore, if I increase the m or the p, then this l gets up. So, okay. Why is the uh, re crash larger for a sparser network? That's very clear. I mean, if you have a dense network, then you can assume that we are part of one cycle, but you may be also part of another cycle. Remember, there are many cycles coexisting, in fact. Yeah? Once you are part of one of the cycles, then your production or your innovation is boosted by the others, by input of the others. Someone is removed from the system, a new node enters the system and is randomly linked to other nodes. And that means it's also, with a certain probability, linked to you again, even that you are already part of the cycle, right? So that means you are then part of different cycles. And therefore, if you are part of different cycles, which occurs only for denser networks, then of course, a crash in one of these cycles will not affect the system as much as if we have a sparse network. No, that's understandable. If we have only a few links, then the system is very vulnerable. That's correct. That's what you see here. What you also see is, I mean, that's one message. The other message is, how long does it take before a cycle emerges? So you see here, like, uh, for, for, uh, for this red curve, it's about 4,000 iterations. So here it's only 1,000 iterations, and here it's only, like, 200 iterations. Right? But in the self-study, you were asked to simulate Yes. Um, well, my Aha, uh -huh, okay. So that's something I cannot an answer because then we have to look into the self study again. Yeah, but if you look at the average um, yeah. link density, yeah. you have a higher, you have if, if there's a crash, mm -hmm. more links get severed if M is higher. Mm -hmm. yeah. But also the, the total number of links is much higher for higher things. Mm -hmm. That's why I said I, I would suppose it cancels out. Yeah, that's. That's something, then I have to recheck the self-study tasks again, yeah? because I'm not so sure that you have defined the average L the same, the same way as, uh, as this was done in the paper. There could be a difference, right? So, but you understand why denser networks are uh, a bit more robust against these crashes, yeah? because you can be part of different cycles, hopefully. Yeah, but so that's something we then have to find out. I can also look into the paper and we find then how the uh, L is defined. Right? I think that's the issue. So other questions? Yeah, I know this is the hard part now because to ask the question basically 
means that you have <laughs> gone through all of the lectures, which you certainly didn't do uh, for today, because the exam is only in August, right? I, I can understand that. But there might be things that you want to rediscuss also about the different topics. What do we need to learn from whatever the Marx model or something like this? Yeah, I can also uh, open the syllabus and when we go through this, if you want. Okay. Please, yeah. One more question if it's okay. Yeah. Um, it's in the same lecture, it's the slide 15. 15, yes. It's the advanced model. Yeah. Yeah, and then we start with an empty graph. Before we started with the random graph. Mm -hmm. Why so? Just, well, it's kind of a bias if we start with a different lecture. Why do we choose an empty graph in this one? We choose the empty graph because in this model we were basically interested in what I call the path-dependent process here, okay? The path-dependent process is best shown if I have a sequence of decisions where the next decision is based on the previous decision and so on and so on and so on, right? That's the meaning of path dependence. If I start with a random network, then the path dependence is basically mixed with the randomness of the network. I can c create random lock-ins, yeah, which are not path dependent. In order to avoid this, we started like this. And this, by the way, the assumption for the economist is usually to start with an empty network, because here we talk about strategic network formation. And strategic network formation means at any time, the agents decide about a link, right? So, whereas, Alex, if you start with a random network, then you st have the idea, okay, there was a time where no one thought about creating links, and then there was another time where they were very curious about why they have the link, right? So, that's an assumption that you can uh, basically... Uh, that you can hardly defend, right? Because then you assume, okay, there was... Yeah, in, in previous times, firms never cared about well, with whom they had a link, therefore we can assume it's random. So, so that's a, it's an issue of argumentation. But the most important thing is here the, the path-dependent process. Maybe I should open the syllabus and then we go through this. And if you have specific questions for the content, then it would be good if you ask them. Where's the syllabus? Oh, the syllabus is on Mendeley, right? Oh, well maybe it's here. No. Okay, I don't know where the... Oh, outline here, no. Syllabus. Okay, I don't see the latest version here, but let's basically, uh, that was something else, so syllabus. So, this was not the re most recent one, it was from last year, but basically it's qu qu kind of similar. So, questions or comments regarding the first part, data and empirics? I already answered the question, should I know some R commands? The answer is yes. So, okay. So. So. Regarding the distributions, you should basically know what kind of distributions we have discussed. I would assume that at least the structure, the mathematical structure of these distributions can be written down, so you know what the power law is, you know what a normal distribution is, and then once you know that, then you also know what a log normal distribution is, right? So these are equations that we assume you should be able to write down. So, but more important are the stylized facts that we have tried to recover here. 
It's about the uh, size dependence of the variance, for example. This was one of the important things. There were also, there was one slide where we mentioned what we have not found in the data, namely that the mean value doesn't depend on the size classes. So that's something you should also look into, right? Because it helps you a bit better understanding what, what, we, uh, what we did. So then second part is, okay. Uh, regarding the maximum likelihood estimation, I, I do not assume that you can calculate this in the exam, even that we spend a lot of time doing this on the slides. This was to give you a hint that it's doable, right? So, but what you should understand from the whole part is how is this related, the maximum likelihood estimation, to the testing of the distribution, right? Because these are two sides of the same problem, right? So if you test a distribution, then you assume that you know the sigma and the mu, right? But the maximum likelihood uh, estimation only tells you what's the sigma and what's the mu, conditional on the distribution, right? So that's a very important thing. So then regarding the stochastic growth models, yeah. There, I think you should understand uh, the difference between additive and multiplicative noise, and why was an assumption like multiplicative noise chosen for the GBRAD model, right? Why, what, what was the reason behind this? You know? so these are things that we should certainly, uh, that we have certainly discussed. Then regarding the entry and exit dynamics. So there uh, we discussed also some, uh, some starlight facts from the data. So is this a minor or is this a major effect? That's something we have already shown. And then what, how does the distribution changes if we include, for example, entry dynamics, as in the case of the Simon model, right? Regarding this competition and cooperation part, Marx, the Marx model, I would, for example, expect that you are able to write down the competition equation. That's the result. It appeared three times in the lecture, right? Always the same equation. That's something you should be able to write down. So then you probably or in, in, the, in the most simple form, yeah? where the alpha was the same, and so on, right? So. Then you should be able to understand how we got there. There were these two processes, the limited resource and the positive feedback, right? So I explained this three times in the same lecture. Yeah? You should understand the basics. And then we gave an economic meaning to the selection value, which was the cost price. And here I would assume that you are able to explain the economic meaning of the cost price. There were two slides just on the cost price. How is the cost price written? It depends on the exploitation rate and these on the uh, uh, organic uh, composition of capital and so on, right? So that you understand this slide. You should, there's no derivation, but you should understand what is the economic meaning of this, what's the story, you know? and how I, as the entrepreneur or the capitalist, can increase my profit. What should I do, given that this is a selection process? Okay? My suggestion is we just continue, and then we close if there are no further questions. Right? So... Inequality distribution, though that's, I think, was a lecture that you were only uh, uh, recovering yourself. I mean, with the handout and last year's uh, uh, video recording. Are there particular questions? So, what's the Gini coefficient? What's the Lorentz curve? Yeah. What's the meaning of inequality, basically? There was also the self-study task where you had looked into a growing uh, log normal distribution, right? 
and then you had to plot the, the inequality. Right? And then, I mean, once you did this exercise yourself, then you better understand what people discuss in the newspapers, yeah? that inequality has again increased this year. Right? Yeah, okay. It's not a real surprise for you, right? Once you understood the basic dynamics of this, then, I mean, then you can start thinking of what kind of processes do I need to decrease inequality. Yeah, that's, yeah, not, that's not the topic of the exam, but that's the topic maybe for those people who complain about increasing inequality. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to hear from them what they have in mind, right? So then adoption of behavior, this was then um, about these polia processes. There we discussed uh, the simple polia process and there was a more advanced model by Brian Arthur where you had these R and S agents and each of them had a preference to either iPhone A or iPhone B or something, right? So, and then... Uh, there is no need to uh, redo these equations. That's not the important point. But there was a graph, as you recall, which gave us an upper and a lower bound. And once the trajectory has hit this, uh, then the process was locked in. That means it was not reversible. After that point in time, you will not see a community switching back to some other gadget once they are locked in there, right? So that was the result of this model. And I think you should understand this. That's basically, uh, it's a yeah, modification of the simple polia process. But even more important is the question that we then discuss afterwards. What, how realistic is this? Yeah, for the MTech students, I mean, that's the most important question. Do we have to live with this? Or what can we do in order to, to uh, mitigate this situation? Right? There were a few slides why the simple login processes are wrong in some sense. Right? So that's something I recommend for you to look up for the exam as well, that you can critically discuss about the um, importance of lock-in effects, right? Because you as a company, let's assume you are a company, so then basically yeah, you could close the book, so that was it then. Yeah? If this was a real economy, then you can basically go home, right? Because there was nothing you can do. But in fact, you can do a lot, you as a company. And you should understand, okay, what are the additional dimensions that I can do, or, or use or exploit? Right? So, for example, innovations are not considered there. So, there's also the lifetime of the gadget or these kind of things is not considered there. You can influence the lock-in effect before it actually locks in yeah, by modifications of, uh, of the incentive schemes. Yeah, if you buy the iPhone, then you get whatever, a whole Apple computer plus the full software. Uh, for free, or those kind of things, right? So. Okay, yeah, that was basically it. And number 12, as I said, we stopped, or uh, we dropped this year, right? So. Okay. Um, no, because we didn't include it in, uh, in the course right now. As I mentioned in my email, it's a bit more technical. Uh, I'm a bit hesitant to just give you the slide without further explanation because I do not want to confuse you. So then I would rather like to present this here and say, well, this is the difference to the previous adoption models. Huh? The difference, by the way, is not so much in the dynamics. The difference is in the formalism. That's more of interest for the physicist. Then we write what we would basically do for stochastic dynamics. We would write down a master equation. We have transition rates and so on. That's a better or the more uh, appropriate formalism to address this in a stochastic context. So that's what you can learn from there. 
Okay, further questions, content-wise. Yeah, please. Yeah. Concerning the Lawrence Cotton symmetry, mm -hmm. because I was curious about this mm -hmm. because I couldn't really figure out which distribution uh, works the other way, other way around. If the Lawrence curve is not symmetric, mm -hmm. what can the underlying distribution find? I think we discussed in the lecture that um, the only thing you can say if it's symmetric, you cannot reject the original result. That's correct. Uh, That's correct. Yes. Yes. But is there something more we can say? Not really. Yeah. So the log normal distribution re usually results in a uh, symmetric dis uh, Lorentz curve. Yes, that's correct. So, but um, it really then depends on um, it really depends on features of s of the distribution. Th you cannot give a general um, explanation for this. By the way, just for your information, if you look into the Lorentz curve, and you should notice that there, is a, there are two axes. One is uh, the percentage of the firms that own a percentage of the, uh, or have, or are responsible for a particular uh, share of the sizes, right? So that's a normal scale. We now talk about Lorentz curves that can be only seen on the logarithmic scale. You may want to think about this. Yeah? So that means the Lorentz curve is so steep, so steep that you do not see anything if you plot this on a normal curve. Right? That's something you can always. So, what kind of economy is behind this? Yeah? That I that the inequality is so huge that I cannot really see this in a normal scale. Right? So, yeah, that's something that we did in our own research right, when we talked about ownership concentration. So, and this is yeah, this can be only discussed on logarithmic scales so, because everything is <laughs> in this 0.1 percent range. Yeah? 1% of all firms own 99% of all revenue, something like this, right? So that means your Lawrence curve looks like this. You, know? so you don't see anything in a, in a normal scale, right? So this is for those who are afraid of inequality. You know? so the real inequality, if you go out and look, in the, is much, much, much larger than you can plot in any Lawrence curve. That's the message of it. No? Okay. Other questions? Comments? Okay. So if this is not the case, then thank you very much for your attention and for participating in the course. And I hope that you can convince a few students of MTech or maybe the physics department to uh, attend the course next year. Uh, one of the lessons I learned is that I will not uh, do this video recording again. Right? So, which is, by the way, the MTech students know, already the conclusion that my colleagues have drawn some years ago. Right? So currently, I think I'm the only one. You know? This was for also for me the last time. I appreciate more to have students in the lecture rather than following these courses, uh, this course uh, at some other time. Okay. So I wish you good luck with the exam. The exam is uh, in August, as far as I was told, and then you just come here. There was no need to have any whatever material with you, you know, a pencil is enough. So, and then you just answer these questions. So they are with A, B, C, D. There is no multiple choice question. You really have to go through the material. And you should write also in a way that we afterwards are able to read this. Right? Yeah. Some students lost a considerable number of points because we could not read what they were 
that they have written, right? So this is my personal <laughs> advice to you. No? Otherwise, I think if you really follow the course, the exam is doable. No? This is not something that's beyond your expectations, maybe. Okay, thank you very much, and then I hope I see some of you maybe in some of the other courses. Yeah?